Welcome to the AMATIC 2015 webinar series. My name is John Oakes and I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for AMATIC and today's presentation is Analyzing Financial Data in an Introductory Statistics Course with Kelly Fitzpatrick and this presentation is sponsored by the Joint Committee of AMATIC and the American Statistical Association or ASA. AMATIC is the American Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges, and our core value is building expertise and exhibiting leadership in the teaching and learning of mathematics, enhancing personal growth, and improving teaching methods and effectiveness as a personally initiated lifelong responsibility. And for more information, please visit our website at amatic.org. And please note that the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC and any commercial products mentioned by presenters are not endorsed by AMATIC. And WebAssign is proud to support the AMATIC webinar series. And so now I'm going to actually switch to Kelly's slides. And so while these slides come up, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, introduce Kelly. So Kelly Fitzpatrick is an assistant professor in the mathematics department at the County College of Morris. She primarily teaches all levels of statistics including honors and advanced. She also enjoys teaching applied calculus for the electrical and mechanical engineering students. Professor Fitzpatrick has over 10 years of corporate experience in finance and a graduate degree in mathematics of finance from Columbia University. Ms. Fitzpatrick earned the right to use the designation of Chartered Financial Analyst in 2006. She has spent many years working in New York City for private hedge funds developing financial models. In 2013, she was one of the founding co-advisors of the Women in STEM Club at the County of, of uh, College of Morris. So with that being said, let's welcome Kelly in the chat room and I'm going to turn it over to you right now. Hello, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar on analyzing financial data in an introductory statistics course. Uh, thank you, John, for the nice introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, John and Mary DeHart for inviting me back um, to do another webinar. I think um, the professional development series that ASA and AMATIC have created is a wonderful resource for our community. Um, today, I'd just like to begin. Um, this was my abstract. I think hopefully you've all read it be, uh, before today's webinar. But today's students are very brand savvy. You know, they have their favorite cell phone companies, they have their favorite media outlets or shopping stores, and many of these companies are publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange or some exchange. Um, I also want to cover a bunch of tools today. Uh, basically, I will walk you through how we can use a data set and really cover all of the material that we walk through in an introductory statistics course, from graphing and plotting data to regression analysis and hypothesis testing. Um, some of the things we're going to look at today is the effects of the BP oil spill in 2010. We're going to look at um, a portfolio of stocks, Facebook and Apple um, are two of them, and we're going to look at international and domestic unemployment rates. Um, so let's see, next. I would also like to highlight what this today's webinar will cover and how it really mirrors some of the guidelines that were recommended from the Gaze report. Um, if you haven't taken time to read this report, I would highly recommend it. It was um, well written and I really like to... I re refer back to it um, because I think some of the points they make about teaching and how to teach statistics are uh, very good. So the points that this webinar will really highlight is to use real data in your classroom, stress conceptual understanding of concepts, uh, foster active learning, and to use technology uh, when developing and analyzing data. And the reason why I like to use financial data in my classroom is because you can really personalize and individualize the data sets. Um, I find some of the textbooks examples to be very boring, and they actually don't interest the students in your classroom. So a lot of times I will pool my students in the beginning of the semester and find out what they're interested in, um, what companies they're interested in. Maybe they have a favorite cell phone company. Um, you know, all the students are familiar with Apple and Facebook, uh, Walmart and Target. Um, things like that. So sometimes I will get together a data set of stocks before I start the semester and then we can talk about them throughout the entire semester. So it's really all about personalizing the data sets that you use in your classroom to really interest your spark the interest in your students. 
um, just an overview of what we're going to cover today. I'm going to cover how to download from two sources, the first one being Yahoo Finance. The second source where I download data is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I'm going to talk about the difference between analyzing prices versus returns, um, analyzing the unemployment rates. And I wanted to just ask you, uh, there's about 10 of you participating today. I was wondering if there was anything specific um, that you're really thought you were going to be interested in seeing today, whether it be plotting, detection of outliers, binomial probability, how it's related to finance, hypothesis testing, correlation analysis, regression analysis, and even though we don't cover ANOVA in our introductory class, uh, we do cover the regression identity, which is the building block and uh, one of the first steps to understanding the ANOVA table. So just take a minute and I'm just interested to see what you're interested in. Okay, so most of you said cor outliers and correlation. Okay, correlation. Oh, thank you, John. So most of you are interested in the hypothesis testing. Oh, someone mentioned central limit theorem. Okay. Outliers. Okay getting the data. Okay, thank you for your feedback. I think last time I did a webinar, um, a lot of people mentioned that they were interested in the hypothesis testing as well, um, which is funny because at the introductory level, that's really the last thing we cover at the end of the semester. But I did include some good examples um, for hypothesis testing. Thank you for your feedback. Okay. So the first thing I want to look at is uh, British Petroleum um, and the effects that the BP oil spill had on the stock price in 2010. Um, why is it important to look at this stock and this event? And you can read the passage that I wrote below. 30% of the population in the United Kingdom actually hold BP stock in their portfolios. So when there was the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, this event not only had a large environmental impact, um, but it also had a large impact on the stock price. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes you can tie in different disciplines. When you're talking about these data sets, you can talk about it from the financial perspective. You can talk about it from the environmental perspective to maybe you have some environmental science majors in your classroom. So it's interesting to talk about one concept and really tie it into the different disciplines in your classroom. And it, you know, this relates to your business majors. Uh, your STEM majors will be interested in this, and then your environmental science majors will be interested in this. And then I'm going to show you actually also how your journal, journalist majors or, you know, your English majors can also use this information. So first I want to show you where to download data. Um, stock prices, um, I guess you used to have to pay for them, but now they're available for free. And I wrote the steps above on the top of this slide. You just go to www.yahoo.com. And I tried to circle everything in red um, because the web pages do have an overabundance. Um, you know, there's information all over the place in where do I click. So then you would click on the left-hand side. I circled the word finance. And then you would go to quote lookup, and then you would go to historical prices. So first I'm going to walk you through how to download and format the data. Here I circled on the left-hand side, you would type the quote lookup. Then you would see, it's sorry it's so small, but it says historical prices on the left-hand side under summary. You would actually click on historical prices. Here I started with Facebook, but then I actually switched to BP. But Facebook is FB. You would have typed that into the quote lookup. Or uh, BP is BP. And then you would click under historical prices, and you could actually set the date range that you want. You know, whether you want to look at data from here, I have year 2000 to 2014, and I actually clicked monthly data. You can just look at the past year's data and hit daily data, or you can download weekly data. Uh, for the purposes of my classes, if I'm going to look at over 10 years of data, maybe I'll just look at the monthly data or the monthly prices. Um, if I'm looking at daily data, maybe I'll just look at the last four months. 
Um, I actually reformat the data for my introductory class before I, I use it. So I download it, I organize it, and then I give them the clean data set. Here, let me just scroll back. And then you would click Get Prices here. And then after that, you scroll down to the bottom of the page and select it down to Download to a Spreadsheet. So all this data can be easily you know, exported into Excel. So we're going from the internet, the web page, we're going to download it. I just download it into Excel. And this is what the downloaded file looks like. So I'm going to cover some formatting issues on how I rearrange the data set. Um, actually, you don't need all of this information. You don't, you know, um, it gives you the open, the high, the low, the closing price, the volume on the day, and the adjusted closing price. So sometimes after the market, the stock will trade a little bit more. And it gives you the dates. It, um, and there's a certain order, and there's a certain way I like the finalized data set to look, and I'm going to cover that with you. So formatting issues that need to be addressed. First, there's too much information here. So you need to delete the information that is not needed. I just highlight the columns um, that aren't needed and delete them. Next, I'm going to reverse chron chronological order. You always want the oldest price at the top, and the most recent price will be at the bottom. And a lot of times in finance, that's, that's how we organize financial data. The oldest price on the top, the most recent price on the bottom. Um, and you can just uh, simply reorganize that data on the click of a button. Um, I, I think I wrote the steps here. You just go to the Home tab, you hit Sort and Filter, and then you can select Oldest to Newest. Then I add the Return column, um, and I look at, I just used today's price minus yesterday's price divided by yesterday's price. And I add that column to the data set, and I base that off of the closing price. And then you want to save the file in the format you need. Uh, a lot of times I just use a CSV file that can be in, imported easily into Minitab or I use R for my statistical analysis um, and it, the CSV files can be imported easily. Are there any questions on formatting um, the data set so far? And here I've put in, once I've edited the source file, this is what the final version looks like. So I'll have the dates in the first column going from oldest to newest. So you can see on the top I have 2000, then it goes to 2001. I have the closing prices in the second column, and I have the returns in the third column. What happens when you do returns, you actually lose the first observation. So you can see where I highlighted with the arrow down below, you'll lose the January observation. If you want to keep the January observation, then you should have downloaded data from December um, 1999, and then you could have started at January. But you know, for the purpose of you know, using this in an introductory statistics class, that little minor thing doesn't really matter. Can you use Excel or numbers to do the analysis? Um, you can use Excel. Um, I. If, you know, I, the majority of my time on Wall Street, I used Excel, um, but I really have fallen in love with using R for the purpose, and you can really just do, I think, data analysis and regression and correlation much easier in a different software package than Excel, in my opinion, um, even though you can do all this analysis in Excel. Um, so again, for the formatting issues, you want to delete unnecessary information. I like to, the data should be in reverse chronological order. You want to uh, create the return column, and then you want to delete the first entry. So you don't want that return to be zero or have a blank cell. So I usually just delete the first, the, the first observation. And next, I've uploaded this into R. And you can see the top box and whisker plot is the prices, and the bottom box and whisker plot is the returns. And you can actually see, I, I downloaded the data from 2000 to 2014. And you can really see here the effects that the BP oil spill had when you actually look at the return data. So the event actually caused the stock to trade down almost more than 30% in the month of the event. But it's interesting to note that the next month, the stock actually traded up over 30%. Um, but if you look at the price data, the prices got range from 30 to about 80. But I think it's more interesting when you look at the returns, you can actually see those outliers appear when you look at the box and whisker plot. 
And this is nice to see and show your class the effects that this had on the stock price or the stock returns. Next is our side-by-side -side, uh, histograms. The first one is actually looking at the monthly prices, and the second one is actually looking at monthly returns. So when we're conducting financial analysis, and a lot of the models that are built on financial analysis actually are, are built on the assumption that it's the stock returns that are normally distributed. We, the stock prices are not normally distributed. And you don't have to talk about transforming the data that's more for an advanced statistics class. But actually what we're doing by looking at the returns, we're transforming the data. So we're going from prices, which you can see by the histogram. Um, here it looks to be right skewed. Um, it's not a, a bell shaped. Um, and it's nice for students to see these side by side histograms. Here, when we look at the monthly returns, this looks more like a normal distributed distribution. You can see the mean is zero, is zero, and the standard deviation is about 7%. So I think this is nice to show your class. Um, when I went to graduate school, one of the projects was that um, groups had to analyze over five, a portfolio of 500 stocks, and this is what they were looking at. They were really trying to determine of that portfolio how many of the stock returns were actually normally distributed. So that's an interesting exercise. And here the arrow represents that event of the BP oil spill where the stock was down about 30% in that month. Next slide is a normality plot, which we do cover um, normality plots in our introductory statistics class. And here you can really see that the effect that these outliers or the BP oil spill had on the stock price or the stock returns. And if we look at a critical value test, we can see that the calculated correlation coefficient actually is low enough to conclude that the data here is not normally distributed. And I tied this in with the front page article on the on Time Magazine was the big spill. And this is nice for you to see how statistical analysis or the outliers actually are going to be the front page, you know, highlight in the local paper or Time Magazine or the Wall Street Journal. People are going to be writing about the outliers. They're not writing about the average day events or what happens 68% of the time. News stories and articles that hit the front page of the paper are going to be those outlying events, the events that don't happen often. And I think this is nice for when you're teaching a class of you know, liberal arts majors or a bunch of different majors, for them to really see that you could take one data set, you can talk about it mathematically, you can talk about the environmental effects, and now you can see how journalists are going to write about these effects. And I think it's nice for everybody in your classroom or try to get as many majors on board to being interested in what you're talking about. Um, this is a nice way to tie in the binomial probability formula to stock analysis. I would simply just tell my students that there's a 50% chance that the stock could have a positive day or go up. Um, that means there's a 50% chance that the stock could have a negative day or go down. And I would call the up day or the positive day the success. And I would call the down day a failure. And you could ask them what is the probability that the stock will actually trade down five days in a row. So let's just take a different look at how we can ask this question in our classroom and really cover the topic of binomial probability. So first I always like to explain the formula to my class that it's the combination rule times the success part of the formula times the failure part. And if we put these components into the formula, we would have 5 choose 5 times 0 0.5 to the power 0. Actually, that should be 5 choose 0, but you get the same. It's still just 5. So. Times 1 minus 0 0.5 to the power 5. And that would be the failure part of the formula here is what we're looking at. And the answer is that the probability that the stock will trade down five days in a row is 3.13%. So it's interesting that even though this is such a low probability, this event actually did happen. So it's interesting for your class to see that even though sometimes probabilities are close to zero, 
you know, or below 10% or below 5%, that these events really happen. That this is go and when these events happen, the rare events, they'll look like outliers on the box and whisker plots, and they'll be the front story of the local paper or maybe a major magazine. So I have a question for the audience. If a stock's return um, is down 30% in one month and the following month the stock's return is up 30%, are you back to your original value? So this is a nice question to sometimes ask your class. Okay. So I haven't tricked any of you, but your class, um, this is an interesting thing to ask your class, I think. So the answer is actually, no, you're not back to your original value. So just think if you invested $100 in the stock, it was down 30% one month. So you lost $30 and your investment or your, the value of your portfolio, let's say, is back to $70. And then in the following month, the stock goes up 30%. That would be $21. And then the ending value of your portfolio, the stock is $91. So you still lost $9, even though it was down 30% one month and back up 30% the next month. So I think this is interesting to, to talk about with, with your class. Next, I want to look at a different data. Well, before we move on, I guess, are there any more questions about um, looking at BP stock? Um, some of the things I do with my class. Okay, so next I want to look at the unemployment rate. Um, looking at the unemployment rate is very interesting. So you can start off um, talking about how is the survey conducted. It's actually a door-to-door -door survey, and about 50,000 people are surveyed every month, um, which is, I think, one of the largest survey, monthly surveys conducted in the United States. We actually seasonally adjust our reportings, and you really don't have to get into talking about that with your class. But when you do look at international unemployment rates, it's nice to see that some countries seasonally adjust the data, and some countries don't. So it's nice to talk about when you're looking at the data, how, how the initial inputs are different. Um, the unemployment rate is actually reported on the first Friday of every month. So September's unemployment rate was 5.1%, and the next reading for the October unemployment rate um, will come out Friday, November 6th. So a lot of times in my classroom, we go over the unemployment rate, we look at the historical rates, uh, we look at where it currently is, and I always throw out an extra five points maybe on the next test. If they properly or they guess the unemployment rate, um, before Friday's announcement correctly. So everyone will put in their answers whether they think, you know, we're in prosperous times and the unemployment rate has gone down, maybe we're in stagnant times and the unemployment rate really isn't going to change that much month to month, or maybe we're in a recessionary cycle and the, the, they expect the unemployment rate to, to creep up. So right now we're probably in a stagnant time. Uh, the prior month reading before was 5.1, you know, in and then the September reading was 5.1. And the unemployment rate doesn't really change that month that much on a month-to-month -month basis. But it's nice for students to get involved in thinking about these things and how it really affects them. Because when they graduate from the two-year college or the four-year college, and it, you know the unemployment rate is high where it was uh, in previous years, they're going to have a harder time getting jobs. Um, it's pretty low right now, I would say, or back to more around the average. You know, so times are a little more prosperous and it might be easier for students to get jobs upon graduation. Uh, the survey that's conducted actually asks households uh, three questions. And it's important for students to know what questions are asked and how the number is actually calculated. The first question they ask is, are you currently employed? Then they want to know, are you not employed but actively looking? That's really the key to the unemployment rate. The person has to actively be seeking work. The third question is, are you not employed and not actively looking for work? So you're not going to be included in the labor force. People who might not be employed and not actively looking are students, stay-at-home moms, 
or they talked a lot in the past about discouraged workers, who they just stopped looking for work even though they would want a job. So the key to being included in the unemployment rate is that you have to actively be seeking work. Calculating the unemployment rate, if 18,000 people are employed and currently working, 2,000 are not employed but looking, and maybe of the 50,000 surveyed, 30,000 are not in the labor force. So they're stay-at-home mom, students, or discouraged workers. The unemployment rate would be calculated as follows. It would just be 2,000 divided by the 20,000, because the 20,000, that's the um, labor force, and you would get a 10% unemployment rate, which be, would be relatively high. So to download the data, we would go to www.bls.gov. This is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You would click on the tab Data Tools, and then you would go to Top Picks. So I tried to highlight that um, in the red circle. Data Tools is the top toolbar on the top, and then you would click Top Picks. And there's a lot of nice information here that you could download. The unemployment rate just happens to be my favorite one. So here, then I check the unemployment rate. You can see that it says seasonally adjusted. And then I say retrieve data down below. I would just click that button. And you can see you can download prices. You can download C the CPI index. Again, the unemployment rate just happens to be my favorite one. And then you could actually, in the top, I highlighted in the top circle in red, um, you could select dates, how far back you want to go, and um, I forget how far back this goes. I think it goes back to 1946, something like that. So you can go back pretty far and actually download this data and analyze it. And then the second uh, I, I highlighted in red, you download to uh, Excel. So it'll download the data, which is the monthly unemployment ratings, into Excel. And this is what the unformatted data set looks like, or the original data file. So here, again, you need to do some data cleaning, scrubbing the data. And I like to really simplify the data set for my students. I wouldn't give them all this information, all this data. And then either this way, when you do class, I take them to the computer lab a lot of times. And then they have a nice, clean file to already work with. So they would just upload my cleaned data file into Excel or into R or into Minitab. But I do bring this up and I show them how I did format the file so they're aware of what the original data did look like. And I do explain to them what I've done. So from here, I just actually, to make things simpler in the introductory class, I just look at the average across the months. So you can see in 1995, the average unemployment rate was 5.6. Um, and then you can see in 2010, the average unemployment rate was 9.6. And that's really what we're going to look at here in the next few slides. So again, editing the source file, I feel like, is very important. You don't want to overwhelm your students with a data file that's messy, a data file that can't be easily uploaded. So you want to delete unnecessary information. In financial analysis, we always look at things in reverse, chronolo reverse chronological order. So you want the 1995 on the top, 2014 would be on the bottom. Here I created the average column. So instead of having a column of all the different months, I just wanted one column of data. I really just wanted to simplify the data set for my class. And then save the file in a format that you need. You could save it in Excel. Again, I always usually save things in a CSV format. And then I just drew a nice box and whisker pop plot below. And you can ask your students, what is the median? What's the low? What's the skew? or what's the overall shape of this distribution, it can lead to some nice conversation. Another way that I actually downloaded this data, and I did have to do a little bit of formatting here, um, is I put, I did this by decade. So I put all the 1950s in one column. So it would be 1950 to 1959. The next column I did the 1960s. The next column, the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, and then I did year 2000 in the la or you know 2000 to 2009 in the last column. 
And what this did and the reason why I reformatted it this way is because then it was easy to upload into R and it was easy to do um, the box and whisker plots comparison. So let's just take a look at that. So this took some reformatting. But the reason why I did that is because in one line of code in R, I can produce, which I think is a very, very interesting analysis of the unemployment rates by decades. And it really, really highlights that um, in year 2009, this outlier really stands out. So let's just go back. I guess here's 2009, I had 9.3. So I stopped the data set at 2009. You could see here in 2010, it's 9.6 again. So these two points would really stand out. So I need another 10 years. But so here, the 9.28 in 2009, I'm really showing my students how this had a big impact, why this was so important when Obama ran for re-election. And he talked about really getting this unemployment rate down over the next four years. And we can see that he was really successful at that because now the unemployment rate is uh, 5.1. I think it's interesting for students to see this. I think it's interesting for them to see it, how it stands out statistically. And you, they can really look at different time periods and see how just recently we had such a high unemployment rate in our country. Uh, so here's my first hypothesis test that I included. You want to determine at a 5% significance level is the average monthly unemployment rate uh, from year 2010. Is it greater than the historical average of 5.7%? And here I used R again to do the analysis in one line of code. I did the t-test. And we can see clearly the average in 2010 ended up being 9.6%. And yes, this is greater than the historical average of 5.7%. But they could see the p-value is very, very small here, pretty much close, pretty much zero. So in fact, they would reject uh, the null hypothesis and conclude that the average unemployment rate is greater than, and sorry, I have a, a little typo there, greater than the historical mean. Um, this is a nice way to do hypothesis testing with your class, even though it may clearly be, you can see that um, the average in 2010 was greater than the historical average. But it's nice for them to see what a small p-value looks like um, or when the p-value comes out small, it's reported in scientific notations. A lot of times your students won't understand what that 1.482 and the e to the negative 14, you'll have to explain that to them. You'll have to explain the scientific notation and how that number is pretty much zero. Um, I think that's nice to do with your class. It's also nice to do if you just state um, the hypothesis test. I really think more time should be spent on understanding the output of the p-value. Instead of really doing the hypothesis test, the critical value approach, which is nice in theory to do the critical value approach. And that's really, you know, for the most part, what I do spend my time teaching my students. But I really think more emphasis should be placed on just understanding more how to determine the answer of hypothesis testing or stating the null and alternative hypothesis and really using the p-value to draw the conclusion. I think most of the time my students where they struggle in hypothesis testing is actually in the conclusion um, and making that final statement about the data they're looking at. Any questions on this hypothesis test? Um, you can just type it into the text box below. As someone is typing, so I'll just wait. Um, no, we do not do the two means in our introductory statistics class. We do that in the adv advanced class. So that's why I, I set it up this way. Um, R is a free statistical software package. It's uh, www.r slash 
project.org, I think. And if you go and look at my past webinar that I did with ASA and AMATIC, I really talked about using R in the introductory statistics class. So if you're unfamiliar with R, maybe that's a good webinar that you could watch after this webinar. This webinar was really focused on just looking at financial data, and my software of choice is R. Um, so whether you use Minitab or Excel that's or SAS or some other program, that's up to you. Uh, do I ask students for... No, I don't actually ask them to propose their own test, the hypothesis testing questions, although I think that would be more productive, and I think that would be interesting to see what questions the students come up with. So I think that's, a, that's probably a good way to do it. Um, I really guide my class myself and give them the questions. Um, sometimes I don't think they're quite ready to pose their own questions, but I think maybe in an advanced class or the honors class, I think that would be a nice way to do it for the students actually to come up with their own hypothesis. Um, I will be more than happy to also uh, provide John with the code that I used in to produce these results and to produce the charts. Um, actually, uh, you can upload, I'll give John the PowerPoint. You can all have permission to the slides. Um, I will actually give you the data files and I can give you the code. I have um, no problem doing that. And thank you, John. He provided the web link on where to go um, to download R. It's a free statistical software package. Um, I actually enjoy using it, although some people think it has a steep learning curve. Um, I think if you do it properly, um, you can actually use it in your introductory class, although I think some people don't recommend it, but I have been doing it for years in my introductory class, and I find the students really enjoy using it, and I personally enjoy using it as well. Thank you for your questions. So the next question I want to ask is, which country has the highest unemployment rate in 2014? Is it Italy, France, Greece, or Spain? So I'll let you guys, I'll let John put up the polling question and see what you guys think. So take some time to answer this. Okay, I think that's all 10 people. Thank you. Uh, the answer is Greece. So most of you answered Greece. And let's just see statistically why Greece has the highest unemployment rate or what happens when we look at um, international data. So I'm, gonna, I'm sorry there's so much information on the slide, although I did want to include all the points. So where I got this data, I actually hand typed this into the Excel file. I got, I, this actually comes in The Economist, uh, every publication. There is a global analysis of the unemployment rates. You can get the 10-year interest rates. And then I just created the misery index. So one of the textbooks we used to have used to look at the misery index of the United States. I thought a nice spin on that problem would be to look at the, in, misery index on a global level. And then I always like to ask my class, a lot of my students either have parents from different countries, um, some of your students you may find have come from different countries into your class. Um, so again, I want to get my students involved in the data. I want to have data sets that are interesting to them, and I want to have data sets that they're invested in or that relate to them. Um, so sometimes this is a nice way to get to know your class, to talk about some things outside of just number crunching all the time. So that's a nice uh, leading into or a nice segue before doing this problem. Just really get to know them. Where are you from? Where are your parents from? And then, you know, look at the countries that you're from and wh what are those unemployment rates? So here you can see from the data set, this is actually from August 30th, 2014. And you can see that Greece does have the highest unemployment rate. It's about 27.2%. And you can see that they have the highest misery index. So high unemployment and high interest rates lead to an unhappy country. So that's interesting um, to see. Where does the United States fall? The United States has, at the time I downloaded the data or entered the data, they had an unemployment rate of 6.2%. Uh, you know, our interest rates are very low, um, 238 
and our misery index. Um, you could see I put the global average down, so our average is below the global average of the misery index. And you could do hypothesis testing that way. You could say, is the misery index of the United States uh, below the global average and test that. You can, same thing with the unemployment rate. Is the unemployment rate of the United States statistically below the global average? And look at things that way. Again, then I plotted the box and whisker plot, and you can see the two countries that stand out. Above 32 here, Greece is Misery index is 32.87, and South Africa is 33.26. I think today, if you downloaded the same data set, I just went to the our most recent um, publication of The Economist, and you can see that the unemployment rates in Greece and South Africa still stand out, or the misery index would still stand out to be relatively high um, internationally or globally. And that's what leads to the front page news articles. You know, you see constantly, if you pull up the Wall Street Journal here, this is an article I just happened to see over the summer from USA Today. Um, this was July 7th, 2015. You can see Greece, they're talking about Greece on the front page of the paper. They're talking about their the financial situation there and why is Greece on the on the, the cover story? Why did they pick that country to talk about? And you can see the unemployment rates. They're so far above the international levels of other countries. And I think it's nice for your journalist majors to see this, um, to see what determines the story that's going to appear on the cover or the front page of a magazine or a newspaper. Why are they talking about Greece? And we can see that through the statistical analysis. And it ties in nicely to your journalist majors again. Your STEM majors will be already interested in data crunching. And it ties in nice to your business majors as well. So I'm really just trying to tie in all the disciplines when I look at different data sets. I'm trying to get as most students involved and interested in the data that I'm looking at. The next thing I want to look at is analyzing a portfolio of stocks. So here, um, this is from a prior semester. I'm looking at data from January 2013 to April 2013, and I'm looking at the daily returns. And I've downloaded, I included the raw data for you, uh, just a small snapshot of the raw data of Apple, Disney, Facebook, General Electric, Target, and Walmart. So these are stocks that my, my class chose to look at. Um, then it's nice, you can you know talk to them about the returns. And what I did is I built a correlation matrix. Again, if you use R, to me it's so easy, it's one line of code. Here I have the correlation matrix, I can export it to Excel. And a lot of times um, I'll just print it out for my class I'll go over the properties of the correlation matrix, how it's uh, the number of rows and columns are the same, it's symmetric, um, why the diagonal is always one, what does that mean. It's nice for them to you know, just talk about the matrix, the properties of the matrix. Again, in my pra past presentation that I gave through ASA and AMATIC, I think I talked about this. So, and then I can just ask them general questions about the correlation coefficient. So all the numbers in the boxes here are the correlation. So I may want to ask them, what stock has the highest correlation to target? We can see that it's Walmart at 0.47. Or I might ask them, and, and that's what we would expect, that Walmart and Target are the two stocks in this portfolio that are mostly related, that are you know this, in the same business line. Or I may ask them, what stock, if I want to diversify my portfolio, I might want to add a stock that has no correlation to target or the weakest relationship to target. And here we can see that would be the stock that has the correlation closest to zero with target. So we can talk about diversification, although it's not a business class and they might not understand that when you speak to them about that. But diversification means that I would want to select a stock that actually has no relationship to target. And then that would be Facebook. So you can say what student picked Target, what student picked Facebook, what student picked Walmart. Again, relating the data back to the students. So I think a correlation matrix is a nice way to bring in classroom discussion into your classroom. I print out the matrix, we go over it, we talk about it, um, and I, I really find that to be a fun exercise. I enjoy doing that with my class. 
And then here's a box and whisker plot. Sorry again for the font being so small, but you might not notice your attention all of a sudden focuses on the right hand side. That's where most of the data is. But if you look on the left, there's actually a one outlier in Apple. It must have been down, looks almost like 20% or maybe 15%. Maybe I should add some more points here along the x-axis. But anyways, it's interesting to notice that point. Sometimes I will make them look at the outliers. And because this is data that was recent, the semester I used it was January from April, they actually, the class had to go back, you know, go to Google and analyze what happened on these dates for their stock. So Walmart has an outlier to the left. Whoever selected Walmart would have to go back and research that date and then come back to the class discussion and tell me what happened on that day. Why does that data point stand out as an outlier? Uh, you can see Disney has also um, two outliers to the left. Whoever selected Disney stock would also have to go back and investigate that. Maybe if you're in the computer room, the students can investigate what news happened about that stock on that day. Did they report low earnings? Um, something like that. So I'm interested in them finding the outliers, detecting the outliers, and then telling me what actually occurred. What was the news story? What was the event? And this is my last slide. Um, I will end here. What I'm doing here with regression analysis and kind of the in start of looking at the ANOVA table is we would want to predict the price of Target, actually the returns, I'm using return data, and what stock would give you the best results when you're looking at a regression analysis. So here I really tie in the relationship to the correlation coefficient to actually starting to talk about um, what you would pick for your variable selection. So if you're actually trying to predict the returns of target, what stock would give you the best results? Or I guess what stock would give you a model with the lowest SSE? Uh, what stock would give you a model that had the highest SSE? Um, I think it's this is a much more interesting way to talk about regression to talk about the correlation coefficient than just number crunching through formulas in your class, which I find I don't really enjoy and the students don't really enjoy. Um, this is a nice way to tie in conceptually how things are related. So here, let's just look at, if I look at targets returns and I do a regression analysis with Facebook, this had the lowest correlation coefficient. It was negative 0.07. And I can see and build the regression line. And I can actually see what happens to the um, coefficient B sub 1, although we don't test the coefficients in the introductory statistics class. We do that in the advanced class. But here you can see that, in fact, the, um, the coefficient here would be testing as 0. So this would be a useless model. And we can see that, again, when we look at the, uh, the beginning of the ANOVA table, we can see that we have a very, very high SSE, or we would have a very, very low R squared. If we look at the other model that I built, um, you can see that I'm comparing targets returns to Walmarts. I'm just very, you know, we just do simple linear regression. Um, but this is a nice idea, and it's nice for students to see that here my correlation coefficient is 0.47. This was the highest correlation coefficient with target was Walmart. We can see that when we build the regression model, that we actually get a coefficient, or B sub 1, that is not 0. And that, again, that we do that, the testing of coefficients, not in our introductory class, but the advanced class. Um, but here you could just, they could just write the equation of the regression line from the, from the software package. And then it ties in nicely with the beginning of talking about the ANOVA table or relating the ANOVA table to the regression identity. And what you want to see is this had the highest correlation was between Walmart and Target. And you can see that this produced the lowest SSE. So the SSE or the sum of the squared error terms for the second model was 56, where the first model produced a sum of squared error terms of 72. And I really want students to see that the higher the correlation coefficient between the two variables will cause the, uh, the SSE to be lower. Um, to me, I, I 
think that's more interesting. Which model is better? Which model produces the lowest SSE? Um, some questions that are, are lacking in some of the, the textbooks. Um, so that's where I really wanted to end to, sh to show you this. Um, and I hope you enjoyed today's webinar and today's series about, series about talking about financial data and how you can look at it in the introductory statistics class. So I'll open up the session. I think we have about seven minutes left uh, for questions. And thank you for attending today's webinar series. Thank you, John, and thank you, Mary, also, for helping set this up. If all of you want to thank Kelly in the chat room real quickly, that would be great. I noticed that a couple of people might need to run to class. I realize that it is a Monday morning for most of us, so let me actually go ahead and hide hide these real quickly so that I can put up the survey link for those of you who need to run right away. So I hope it's okay, Kelly, but all of you will get a copy of the slides as well. Okay, so let's see. Uh, maybe if you don't mind, Kelly, um, you can answer a couple of the questions in the chat room while I I do this closing real quickly. Uh, sure. Thanks for participating in today's AMATIC webinar. If you'd like to support future AMATIC webinars, please consider becoming a member of AMATIC at bit.ly slash join dash AMATIC. And please remember to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash AMATIC. And recordings of past AMATIC webinars can be found at bit.ly slash AMATIC-webinars. And it typically takes us one to two weeks to produce and upload webinars to this archive. And if you could please take two minutes to evaluate the webinar content and the presenter at bit.ly slash AMATIC40. If you need email confirmation of your participation in this webinar, please fill in the optional section at the end of the evaluation. So again, if you need a certificate, uh, please click on the link on the screen or just type it into your web browser. And um, we do appreciate your feedback. So I'm going to end the recording right now.